This next section is on the test for independent variables and homogeneity of proportions. Okay, so we'll start with the test for independence and then on the second part of the section we'll go over to homogeneity of proportions. Uh, the reason they're both bundled up into the same section is because the calculation for each one of these is very similar. So let's talk about contingency tables. In a contingency table we have two qualitative categorical variables and we often wish to determine whether these two variables are related in some sort of way. So we are dealing with categorical variables here. To perform a test for independence, the test used to determine whether there is an association between a row variable and a column variable in a contingency table is called the chi-square test for independence. It's similar to the goodness of fit chi-square test, but it's different because we're going to de be dealing with tables instead of lists. The null hypothesis is always going to be that these two variables that we're talking about are not associated in any way, okay? that they're actually independent from each other. Uh, the alternative here would be that these two variables are associated with each other, that they essentially are dependent, right? Because independent and dependent are mutually exclusive. So the idea behind testing these types of claims is to compare the actual counts to be expected if the null hypothesis were true. And if we see any significant difference between the actual counts and the expected counts, then we have evidence to, against the null hypothesis. And we say that, well, maybe they are dependent on each other in some sort of way. Now, the derivation of this formula here is, is pretty involved, but we're just going to take the results of that derivation. And this is how you would count, calculate the expected frequency. We take the row total times the column total and divide it by the table total, or grand total. Okay, so let's talk about this in, in an example, like a very simple example here. Let's say that a food stand sells three items, okay? And we're trying to see if the choice that a person makes when eating at this food stand, either a pizza salad or a hot dog, has any dependency on their gender, male, female, pizza, salad, and hot dog. And what we see here are all the observed counts. Okay, so there's a food stand. Maybe they, um, this is probably like a week's, week's worth of sales. And they notice that there was 204 males that ate pizza, 199 males that ate a salad, 214 males that ate a hot dog. And for females, we have 96 that ate pizza, 121 females ate a salad, and 98 ate a hot dog. Now the question here would essentially be whether your choice in what you eat and your gender have anything to do with each other. Are they dependent on each other? Okay, so this is the column variable and this is the row variable. Okay, now if these two variables were completely independent, meaning that your choice in what you eat has nothing to do with whether you're male or female, then this is what we expect the count should be. Let's go ahead and get the totals for each one of these columns and rows. And if you were to add the first column, the 204 plus 96, we get 300. And let's continue adding everything up. Now the entire table total would be essentially like the grand total. So if we add up all six of those values, you would actually get number of observations, which is 932. We're going to call that N. In order to calculate this expected count here, for this first box here, we're going to get the row total. Okay, what's the row total? Well, it's 617 times the column total. Down here it's 300. See where I'm getting these numbers? And divided by the grand total, 932. Okay. Now I didn't go through the derivation of how they came up with this formula, but this is the result of coming up with the expected value. If these two variables had nothing to do with each other. If you were to multiply and divide those two numbers, you would get something like this, 198.61. Okay. We expect 198 people, males and who were to eat pizza, uh, what we got instead was 204. Now these two numbers aren't far off from each other, not, not by much, but 
who knows? We would have to run a test in order to figure that out. Okay. This this entire ex example is just an exercise on how to come up with these expected counts. Okay. And of course, let's continue doing this. We get 617. That's the row total. The column total here is 320 divided by the grand total. And we get. And we're going to continue the same pattern. Okay, now as you can see, I have calculated all the expected counts. And if you compare them to what they what was actually observed, like 204 versus 198, 199 versus 211, this one was pretty close, yeah, somewhat close. You see that that's what we expected to happen. Okay. Now if these values are significantly different from what they were expected to be, then we can say that maybe there is some sort of dependency on whether you're male or female and the food choice you have. Okay. If these numbers are pretty close to each other in aggregate, right, then we there's not enough evidence to reject that these are independent variables. Okay. So essentially whether you're male or female has nothing to do with your choice of food. Okay, that, that wasn't a complete example. That was just me showing you how to come up with these expected frequency tables based on observed data. And of course, these six numbers that are boxed into each other, uh, they should all add up to be the grand total of 932 also. Now, I'm going to show you that you're probably not going to have to do this often um, because your calculator kind of does it for you. It gives you the answer to the test set and then it gives you this expected uh, we call it a matrix we'll talk about that in just a bit okay so let's go on to the six steps to coming up with a hypothesis test for these types of problems the requirements for a hypothesis test using a chi-squared test for independence if a claim is made regarding the association between or independence of two variables in a contingency table we can use the following steps to test the claim, provided that the samples are obtained using simple random sampling. Okay, All expected frequencies are greater than or equal to 1, just like the GOF test. And no more than 20% of the expected frequencies are less than 5. Okay, so step 1 here is, like we mentioned before, our hypothesis statement, our row variable, and our column variable are independent. And the alternative is that these two variables are dependent. It's always in that order. Step two is the same as before, significance level. Step three, you may recognize this from the previous section. This is the exact same calculation, really. It's the same calculation. What we observed minus the expected squared divided by the expected. Okay, so technically you can do this by hand. It's just a little tedious if you have a whole bunch of these values, but it can be done. Uh, but I do say use the calculated directions in step four to come up with this. Now the degrees of freedom here, which for calculate for some reason doesn't even require it, but for some reason you do need to use uh, degrees of freedom. It's the rows, total rows minus one times total columns minus one. Multiply those numbers, and you get the degrees of freedom. Okay, step four, in order to calculate the test stat and the p-value, we're going to go into a new menu that we haven't talked about yet. It's called uh, a matrix menu. Okay, so it's essentially a matrix is just a table. Okay, we have to specify the number of rows and columns, okay, depending on what type of table we have. And then we just enter all the entries, all the observed values. Okay, and we're going to put that into a... I'll go through all these details and once we're doing an example. It'll, it'll make more sense. Right now it's a little abstract. And then we're going to go into the stat menu. We go to tests. And that one chi-squared test that should be on everybody's calculator, whether you have a TI-83 or an 84, it's just called chi-squared test. It's not the one that says chi-squared GOF test. So just make sure you're using chi-squared test. And once we go through the example, I'll, I'll go through all these steps. It's a little involved. Okay, so of course you can refer back to this if you're just reading this in text. Okay, of course your outputs are going to be your test stat and your p-value, just like usual. 
And then from there, once you know your p-value, you're gonna be able to compare your p-value to your alpha in step five to make our decision. And of course, step six is coming up with our conclusion statement. All right, let's go ahead and do an example. Example one, in a poll, 883 males, 893 females were asked, if you could have only one of the following, which would you pick? And the choices are money, health, or love. And the responses are presented in the table below. Tessa claimed that gender and response are independent. Okay, so whether you're male, female, and what your choice of the response are, are independent. That's the claim statement. All right, so let's start with step one. Step one is our hypothesis statements. And we have the two variables, right? Gender and response. And the null hypothesis is always that they're independent. And the alternative is the opposite of that, that they are dependent. And our claim statement is that gender and response are independent. That is the claim statement. So that matches up with the null hypothesis. I want to identify that. That's a complete step one. Step two is our significance level, which is right there, 0 0.05. Step three is calculating that expected count matrix. Okay, so as you can see, these six numbers here are the same ones as above. Okay, I haven't changed those, but we're going to calculate the expected here. Now, we could do it the same way that we did in the previous page, but I'm going to show you that there is a shortcut. Okay, not sure why your calculator does this, but it just creates it for you automatically. And it should, right? Because there seems to be some sort of logical way that these numbers were calculated. So, of course, your calculator just does it for you, which is actually quite nice. All right, so let me show you how to do that. So we're going to kind of do it backwards. So we're going to come up with the test at first and then just list out the expected values. All right, so let's come up with the test at the sum of our observed values minus the expected over the expected. And let's do this. We're really just going to put these six numbers into a calculator. And we're going to go to a new menu in our calculator called matrix. And let's go to the calculator to show you how to do that. OK, here we are at the calculator. All right, in order to find these matrix menu, that we're going to talk about. Do you see on the left hand side of the calculator where it says math and right below it in blue it says matrix, right? So you want to make sure that you press second and that button right below math. What you'll see here is there's names and then there's math and then there's edit. Let's go all the way over to edit and I'm going to go ahead and put this observed matrix as we call it in A. Just go ahead and press enter on this. Okay. Right now I have a two by five matrix. That means two rows, five columns. I want two rows, three columns. So make sure that's two. And I'm going to change that five into a three. So scrolling over to it and just press enter. Okay. So it changes it to that. Now I'm just going to type in 82, press enter, and it's going to scroll over to the right automatically. So then you do 82, 446, 355, and so on. So let's go ahead and do that. And it automatically goes to the second row. Okay, double check your inputs. Looks fine. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and completely back out of this. Uh, second, quit. Okay. That's all the inputs we really need. Now we just have to go to the correct test function. Let's go to stat, go to test. If I go up, it's probably a shortcut. Go to chi-squared test. Uh, both the 83s and the 84s should have this. If I press enter here, okay, my observed matrix is an A right there. Now. It's asking for an expected matrix. Was I supposed to calculate that and put it into the expected matrix? You would think so, the way it's set up here. But weirdly enough, it actually creates your expected matrix for you. It's a, kind of a weird thing. So in reality, what it's actually saying when it says B there, 
It's saying, where do you want me to place the expected matrix after we calculate? Okay, that's really what it's saying. So the inputs are really A, and the expected is essentially an output. Where do you want me to output the expected matrix? And then we're just going to go ahead and calculate. All right, so we have essentially everything we need. We have the test at, we have a p-value. That p-value is pretty small, 1 times 10 to the negative 8. And that's enough to get to step 5 and 6, of course. Uh, but because I am allowing you to use this calculator, you have to show me that you inputted this correctly and you have to show me these expected counts. Okay. Now you can do them manually like we did in the previous page of these notes, but you can actually come up with the values if you just look at look it up on matrix B. So let's go ahead and quit out of this. Actually, let me go ahead and get, copy over these numbers. 36.84, that was using chi-squared test. And let's go ahead and copy over the p-value was also 1.00 times 10 to the negative 8. All right, so let's go ahead and quit out of this, second quit. And if I go over to the matrix menu again, second matrix, and you notice that that b, it used to say 2 by 5, right? Now it says 2 by 3. That's because it's been changed. If I go over to edit, and if I scroll down to b press enter okay those are the expected counts and what i want you to do is just copy them over okay even with those decimal places so let's go ahead and copy those over okay as you can see what we observe and what we expect those numbers are pretty far off from each other almost in every single one of these cells right 446 and 507 they're pretty far off um, in fact they were significantly different so of course, if we were to draw a picture for this, here's zero, and your test set is a 36.84. These are always right tail tests, just like the, the previous section. And the area in that right tail is this p-value, so it's very tiny. That's why I know it's way far out here. I mean, kind of exaggerating the size of this shaded region because it's a very small area. We're going to make our decision by comparing the p-value to your significance level. It's a very small number. It's definitely smaller than whatever alpha was. In our case it was 0 0.05. So we are going to reject the null hypothesis here. Okay, what was the null hypothesis? That they are independent if we reject the null hypothesis, then we have sufficient evidence to reject the claim. So that's what our conclusion statement is going to be. Let's go over to the flowchart for that. Okay, here we are at the flowchart. The null hypothesis was a claim, right, that they were independent. And in our conclusion, we were able to reject the null hypothesis. So there is sufficient evidence to warrant rejection of the claim that gender and response are independent. All right, that's the one example on the test for independence. Now we're gonna go over to performing the test for homogeneity of proportions, okay? Uh, homo means same, so it just means that these proportions are the same for different populations, okay? So if we have a bunch of different populations and we're calculating the proportion of some sort of characteristic of some individuals from different populations, then the null hypothesis would essentially be that, well, they're all the same proportion, okay, until we have evidence to suggest otherwise. Now, the calculations are all exactly the same as we did for the test for independence, so there's not much to go over as far as the six steps, because they're exactly the same six steps. Okay, so let's go ahead and do this example here. The following question was asked of a random sample of individuals in 1992, 2002, and 2008. And that question is, would you tell me if you feel being a teacher is an occupation of very great prestige? Okay. So, again, this survey was done in three different time periods, 1992, 2002, 2008. So, of course, you might have 
different results, right? You might have the same, okay? You might have the same results. That's what we're trying to see here, okay? The results of the survey are presented below. Test the claim that the proportion of individuals that feel being a teacher is an occupation of prestige is the same for each year, okay? So that's what the, the claim is, that it hasn't really changed, that that public opinion hasn't changed much from each one of these time periods. Now, the numbers here, I specifically chose them to be very easy to deal with, okay? Um, what we did was we have a thousand people that were surveyed in each year. It doesn't have to be the same number, but in this case, N1, it was a thousand if you were to add up these two numbers. N2 is also a thousand if you were to add up these two numbers. N3 is a thousand, okay? Um, we're going to call 1992-1, Now let's start with step one really quick. Step one is that each one of these proportions are exactly the same. Okay, You see that P1 is equal to P2, which is equal to P3. That's how we deal with this, right? Because the claim statement here is that the proportion of individuals that feel being a teacher is an occupation of great prestige is the same for each year. Now they're not all equal to a specific number because there was no specific number that was in the claim statement, right? Uh, it didn't all say that we believe 90% in each year, right? It just says that they're the same, that the public opinion hasn't really changed for these three years, whatever that number may be, okay? And the alternative to that would be that at least one of these proportions is different, right? Because that's all it takes to prove that the null hypothesis is false. Okay, now which one of these hypothesis statements matches up with the claim statement? The proportions are the same for each year. I would say that's this one right here, yeah, because they're saying that they're the same. Okay, that's step one. And just out of curiosity, I'm gonna calculate the sample proportions for each one of these years, right? Uh, we're gonna focus on the yes responses. Now, because this is out of 1,000, I made the numbers really nice. So 418 out of 1,000 is just 0.418, so 41.8%. Uh, P2 hat would be 479 out of 1,000, which is 0.479. And then P3 hat would be 525 out of 1,000, which would be 0.525. These formulas are just x over n, right? Where this is your x and that's your n. All right, so just by comparing these um, from bird's eye view, 41% is pretty low compared to all of them. That's the smallest one. 52.5% uh, is pretty large. There might be some sort of significant difference, right? Because all we have to prove is that one of these is off significantly, okay? So that's what this whole test is all about. Yeah. Just by the looks of it, I can kind of tell that they're off, but I'm not sure if it's significantly off. All right, step two is our significance level, which in this case is 0 0.01. And just like before, we're going to calculate our test step and p-value at the same time using the chi-square test in our calculator. I'm going to put this in matrix A, and then we're just going to uh, write down the results of matrix B. All right, so chi squared equals the sum of your observed values minus your expected values over your expected values. Okay. Now, again, you can calculate the expected values by hand, just like we did at the very beginning of this section, but the calculator already does it for you, so there's really no need for that. All right, let's go ahead and go over to the calculator and put this table into a matrix. Again, we have two rows and three columns. It's not always going to be two rows and three columns. It could be more than that. All right, so if we go to second matrix, I'm going to go to edit. Uh, I'm going to edit A and I have two rows, three columns, so that hasn't changed. And let's just go ahead and put in our observations here. So if we have 418, 479, 525, 582, 521, 475. Let me double check those inputs here. 
looks good to me. Let's go ahead and exit out of this by quitting. Second quit. Let's go to stat. We're going to go to test and go up to where it says chi square test. And my observed matrix is an A. Expected matrix is to be calculated and placed in matrix B. That's really what it's saying here. And we're going to go ahead and calculate. And we have a test stat of 23.11. And the p value is pretty small. Okay. So my suspicions were kind of correct that, yeah, in 2008 versus 1992, those proportions were pretty significantly different. Okay. So let's go ahead and write all this information down 23.11. Your p value was 9.59 times 10 to the negative 6. And again, I do want you to show the expected matrix here. To find that, let's go ahead and quit out of this. I know this seems like it's in reverse order, but since I'm allowing you to use a calculator, I do want you to fill all this out. Second matrix. Let's go to edit. That B matrix should have been the expected matrix here. Okay, you see that? Uh, the fact that we had a thousand from each year, the expected proportion would have been 474 over a thousand, which is 47.4%. Okay, so 474 over and then 526. And that's the same for each one of these. Yeah, so technically the average proportion was, if you were to pull all this together, it would have been, I'm just, you don't have to write this down, but it would have been 0.474 out of a thousand, because it's out of a thousand, right? Looking at the ones that we had above here, as it compared to that, uh, the one in the middle, yeah, the one from 2002 is close to that number, but the other ones are pretty significantly far from that, as you can see here, from the counts. So there was enough evidence to suggest that, hey, maybe the public opinion in each year about this uh, response to this question isn't the same. Okay, so let's continue with this. So you don't have to come up with those sample proportions when you're doing this problem, but that's just more for your, your own insight here. That's what I'm showing here. Here, That test that of 23.11 is way out here because that area to the right should represent a very, very small value, which is 0.00000595, I believe. Yeah, five zeros in front of the nine. Okay, step four. Step five, we're going to compare our p-value to our significance level, p-value being 9.59 times 10 to the negative 6. P significance level is 0 0.01. Yeah, the p-value is definitely less. So we are going to take the risk and reject the null hypothesis because the probability of us being wrong in that decision is very small. Conclusion statement, well, we rejected the null hypothesis, and the null hypothesis was a claim, so there is sufficient evidence to reject that claim. So that should be the wording behind that. But let's go to the flowchart to get the precise wording. Okay, so the original claim was a null hypothesis, and did we reject the null hypothesis in step five? Yeah. So we say there is sufficient evidence to warrant rejection of the claim that, and then we restate the original claim. And the original claim statement was that the proportion of individuals that feel being a teacher is an occupation of prestige is the same for each year. Okay, that's it for this section. Thanks for watching.